Um, my name is Michelle. I'm a nurse at Northwestern Medicine um, and love to do a lot of community education. And joining me today for the Wake Up Call Backpack um, is Sandy Alvarado. And you might be able to see her behind me on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, Sandy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Sandy Alvarado, and I'm also a nurse here in Community Affairs, a colleague of Michelle. All right, so we're here tonight to give you some practical information on current alcohol, vaping, and drug trends. We want to help you learn how to recognize concealment items, locations, and techniques. Our overall goal is to educate um, anyone who has the influential role in the lives of our youth so that we can be aware of what seemingly innocent items um, can be an indication of substance misuse. So today we're going to focus on the top four of our most common drug trends that our youth partake in, which would be alcohol, vaping, cannabis, and prescription drugs. And although they may ebb and flow in how they trend, these still remain the four most common. Um, this presentation today was assembled by people with lived experience with um, drug dependence, family members of individuals um, with substance misuse, as well as law enforcement, school administrators, and our general public. So we are learning um, from you just as much as we're hoping that you learn from us. So our agenda for this evening, we're going to go through drug trends, followed by a backpack search um, to show you some of those concealment items, um, just to give you an idea about how easy it is to conceal certain things. Um, we'll be pausing for questions after each segment, so if you want to hold on to those, we might just answer them as we go. Some things to consider as we chat tonight is that, um, you know, context is key. So not every student that has a water bottle or a deodorant is going to be experimenting with substances, but this knowledge is power. So the more we know, the sooner we can intervene if need be. We know that early intervention and linking an individual to um, the appropriate resources leads to better outcomes. So we're going to start and kick it off with alcohol. Um, so there are many studies with teen substance use, and they mostly show that alcohol is high on the list for substances that teens begin to experiment with. We're gonna show you a quick um, data point. So we collect data or use data that is provided by the Illinois Youth Survey. This is an optional um, survey given to eighth, 10th and 12th graders. It's administered every two years um, by the school. And we follow certain drug trends um, and substance trends. So this survey asks um, who used that substance, in this case, alcohol, um, 30 days prior to when the survey is administered. Um, so as you can see, we are noticing a downtrend in alcohol. And we have learned that counties use these trends to administer curriculum or education to help improve um, the numbers that they're getting. So um, we see a downtrend in this um, over the last couple of years. So there are many signs of alcohol um, consumption, such as the smell or odor on our breath, but kids are getting very creative in ways to sort of bypass this while still consuming alcohol. So some sneaky ways that you might see is soaking of tampons in alcohol and inserting them. Um, both males and females do this. Soaking candy in alcohol and eating them, vaping alcohol, which can be very dangerous, as well as even taking um, some alcohol and dropping it into this really soft vascular tissue in the corner of your eye. Um, it is absorbed very quickly into the bloodstream, so you feel those effects fast. Um, although these ways are not all that common, we should be aware that they're out there if we suspect that a student or a child may be intoxicated without necessarily smelling that. Why are we so worried about um, alcohol consumption um, before age 21? It all comes down to brain development. Um, so here you'll see three different brain scans. The yellow and green are less developed areas of the brain. Between ages 12 and 20 is some of our biggest growing periods, um, especially for those teens. So we're learning to cope with problems, handle stress, deal with anger, and even how to have fun. So if we're adding a substance like alcohol to um, this growing period of our brain, it teaches us that in order to do that thing, like have fun or handle conflict, we need that substance in order to do so. Um, it's important to note that our brain is not considered fully developed until age 25. 
Another reason why it is important to wait until 21 to consume alcohol is that studies show the sooner a person starts to consume alcohol, the more likely they are to become chemically dependent. So as you can see here, those who drink before the age of 14 have a 40% chance of becoming chemically dependent versus those who wait till after the age of 20 that have a 10% chance of becoming chemically dependent. Um, so waiting for both brain development and preventing chemical dependency to alcohol is why we enforce that. Um, any questions on that before we move forward to vaping? Wonderful, well, I'll push us forward and I'll let Sandy take over from here. Okay, so vaping. So alarmingly, e-cigarette or vaping use by high school seniors is higher than cigarette smoking was 10 years ago. So between 2016 and 2018, vaping use in Illinois increased from 18.4% to 26.7% among high school seniors. That's a 45% increase. A 15% increase was seen among eighth grade students and a 65 increase among 10th grade students. So vaping puts youth at risk for addiction and possibly worse asthma outcomes, yet almost 40% of the 10th grade and 12th grade youth believe there is low to no risk of negative health effects. And next, on this next slide, um, we are showing you the adolescent vaping use for King County. So we skipped 2020, but we went from 2018 to 2022. And um, it shows you, the good thing is really, it's on a downtrend. Um, if you look at the top green, that's 12th grade, it went from 28 to 11%. So obviously the programs that um, we collaborate with are helping bring down this trend. Next slide. Here um, in, 20, in 2003, the first e-cigarette e hit the market in China. In 2007, it came to the US. So the first generation of the e-cig looked like a cigarette. It's a cigarette like you see there and were um, created to help people with tobacco dependency to quit. So the devices got smaller, sleeker and easy to conceal. Here I have a couple of devices I can show you. With if you guys can see these, this is pretty cute. Are they coming up on the screen? This is one of them, they're really cool. And here is another one. And we will, um, you will get to see them on the next slide. So next slide. So today there are thousands of devices out there on the market and this is just a snapshot, these devices here. And on the next slide, um, baked substances. So when you hear vaping, we mostly think of nicotine, but nearly every substance can be vaped. So if you see here, nicotine, of course, is the top. Then we have the cannabis, the alcohol, the dabs with um, Michelle, we'll get into the dabs. The cocaine, meth, opioids, um, those are prescription drugs. And then anything, really, they will put on these. Um, I'm holding a... Um, a refillable little um, container. This one is strawberry ice, but this is like a flavor and you can refill these little, little guys. On the next screen is um, nicotine. So here, if you look at the jewel, it says that um, one pack, one pod equals one pack of cigarettes, right? So the jewel came out in 20, 2015. That is when we saw an increase of more students, of more kids using the Juul. It's a very popular device and it's uh, being used by middle and high school students because it's small and it's easy to conceal. So like I said before, one Juul pod is one pack of cigarettes. So that's 20 cigarettes in a pack. So when someone is smoking cigarettes, they know how many they've gone through because the pack is there and it's visible. You take one out at a time. But um, when you are smoking or vaping, I should say, the, you just continue to pull off of these devices. You know, you just continue to, to uh, pull off on them. And you kind of lose control of how much you already vaped. We um, have known that some kids have smoked up to four jewels a day, and that's equivalent to four packs of cigarettes. 
And then these get charged on the computer. It looks like a flash drive. And then the disposables um, right next to that picture are also popular. Like, um, I think this is a disposable actually. And legislation is changing around vaping, especially re regarding the flavor bans, which is what most, um, most of the, more enticing, I should say, to the younger population because of the different flavors. But the disposables do not fall under this ban, so they can stay on the market as is. So one disposable is equivalent to 25 to 50 cigarettes. So once the pods are empty, they can be taken apart and refilled with any other sub substance like THC oil, and these can, can also be sold. And Michelle will get into the THC oil that's under cannabis. In the next slide. Here we have um, nicotine. These are popular devices on the market and there's flavors, there's lots and lots of flavors. If you were to drink a bottle of e-juice, it would kill you. The FDA only requires manufacturers to list ingredients on the bottle as is. They do not have to tell the consumer what happens to the ingredients once they're heated. So formaldehyde, which causes cancer and other toxic metals are released in the body. And when it says that it's nicotine free juice, that is not true. It still contains a small amount of nicotine. And why do teens vape? They were asked, and these are some of the answers that, that they gave us, not as gross as the cigarette smoking. They don't smell. The teeth don't yellow. There's no tar in their lungs. The flavors make it fun. It's easy to hide and get away with. Sorry, easy to hide and get away with. That's where the sleeving comes in. You know, you can go like this, or if you're wearing a sweatshirt, you can um, kind of like pull off of there too, some of the clothes. It gives them a head rush and you don't know the long-term effects of vaping. And, um, and truly, vaping is relatively new. So the long-term effects just aren't known yet. In the next screen, you will see um, looking back at when cigarettes first came out. So they made it look good and glamorous, a nice way to relax. You see the doctors and the babies on here, women. And um, what are we seeing now on this next slide? This is what we're looking at right now. Um, these are really common now commercials. But um, now that we know the long-term effects of cigarettes, this is what we're seeing. But what are we seeing now with the jewel is this right here. So young, trendy people, bright colors. It looks like fun. It looks like cool to be vaping. And um, in the next slide, what do we know the risks of vaping? We do know that it causes mouth and throat irritation, the coughing and the wheezing, the worsening asthma, the chest pain, the raised blood pressure, the raised heart rate, the upset stomach and nausea. So pretty much these kind of sound what smoking symptoms are, correct? And though along the, uh, although the long-term effects aren't known, we do know some short-term effects. So the risks of vaping, if you look at these CT scans, they show normal lungs versus lungs of a person who has been vaping. Um, the vaping lung, when you see that, all that white matter, that is um, white, dense white areas indicate the injury. And I do wanna say that in 2019, the first vape related death was reported here in Illinois. And here, um, the risks of vaping and how nicotine affects you. So no matter what form it is consumed, you know, nicotine can be vaped, smoked, chewed. It's a powerful chemical that causes dependence quickly. So nicotine affects the prefrontal cortex that's responsible for the emotions, the controlling impulses, and most vulnerable to nicotine effects in the teen years, if you remember. Uh, Michelle said that your brain is not fully developed until the age of 25. So repeated exposure reduces the body's ability to release its own natural pleasure giving chemical or hormone. So teens' brains create more receptors to handle the flood of nicotine, resulting in more nicotine needed to feel that effect. 
So risk associated with nicotine use in teens would be depression, anxiety, an increase in impulsive behavior, high risk behaviors, or recklessness. I do want to warn you that this next couple of slides that are coming up are um, fairly graphic photos. So here, so aside from the health effects, the vape devices themselves can be very dangerous. They can explode causing third degree burns on the mouth, hands, and the pockets. On the next slide, we can see this is a CT scan of a 17-year-old whose vape device exploded in their mouth, resulting in a broken jaw. Although explosions are not common, it can happen. So how are the teens purchasing these, right? Well, their first was, they say it's their parents. The, because the parents, they say that they feel it would be safer or harmless compared to cigarette or marijuana use. The second one here, gas stations and vape shops that don't ID, only some online vape stores require IDs. So teens have said that when their parents are sleeping, they go into their wallets and um, take a picture of their driver's license and upload it from the computer. And that's how they are able to make a purchase. And then you also get um, an email that your shipment is being delivered. So they make sure that they're home to intercept the package. And then of course the older friends and then the gift cards, those gift cards that you give them for holidays or birthdays are the same as a credit card and um, children under 18 can use those or teens under 18 can use those. And then I'm going to turn this back over to Michelle for cannabis. All right, thanks, Sandy. Um, so we're gonna move on to cannabis. Um, there is a common misconception that if it's legal, it must be safe, um, but we know that's not true. We just discussed alcohol and nicotine. They're both legal and carry risks, especially on that developing brain. So here's the Illinois youth data for King County for the canna for cannabis use. Again, down trendings, which is excellent. Um, and I know Sandy alluded that we don't have data from 2020. Um, that was COVID year and kids weren't in school during that time, but overall a downtrend um, from the students that do opt to answer. Um, so Cannabis, it's a plant. It contains more than 80 biologically active chemical compounds. There's two that are most commonly known. Um, that's the Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and that's the THC. And we have cannabidiol, which is the CBD. Um, so also important to note that marijuana is a scheduled one substance under the Controlled Substances Act, meaning that it is, um, it does have high risk for potential misuse. So as mentioned, those two compounds, those common ones, the CBD and the THC, um, there's some differences between the two here, but for um, I wanna draw your attention to the fact that CBD is a non-psychoactive component and THC is the psychoactive component of cannabis. Um, so for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna be focusing on the THC compound when we talk about cannabis. So with legalization happening in Illinois, um, and multiple states, there's lots of cannabis infused products and cannabis concentrate that's hitting the market. Um, the legal age for recreational use is 21. Um, so it's also important to note that with this legalization, um, there's lots of new products out there on the market. And we're gonna talk about some of those um, here shortly. So right here's the cannabis flower. Um, this is the most commonly known, um, the, piece of the cannabis. So in the 60s, the cannabis had THC levels of 6 to 7%. Today, we're seeing cannabis up to 10, 20, 30, up to 50%. So it's much stronger than it used to be. Um, many ways that people can um, smoke cannabis. So we see here some vape devices, bongs, glass pipes, blunts, and joints. Um, our youth tend to prefer to vape cannabis because the vapor dissipates much, fa much faster um, than if they were smoking it with a blunt or a joint. So it helps mask um, that overwhelming smell. Another popular form of cannabis out on the market now is a concentration, a concentrate known as a dab. And we are not talking about the dance move here. Um, these are not usually made by teens, but they are purchased. Um, 
And there's many different ways to make dabs, but it's common, the most common way is to take that dry, leafy green cannabis flower, put it in a tube and force butane gas or some sort of solvent through, and out comes this sticky, waxy substance called a dab. And dabs are very highly concentrated um, forms of THC. So we're we just talked about that traditional marijuana, 20 to 40 percent. Dabs contain about 80 to 99 percent THC. So they are very highly concentrated. Concentrated. So only a little bit is needed for that high. So the term adabble do ya really does apply here. And it is popular among high school students. Too much of a dab can cause um, a non fatal overdose that leads to psychosis or blackouts, paranoia, things like that. Now there's many different forms of dabs. Um, but here's some listed here. Most of their names, the crumble, the butter, the shatter, which is more like glass, they do, um, they are named based on what they look like. And they all have different uses and different solvents that um, help create them. But these are other um, dab products that you might see on the market. Now dabs do need a very high heat source to be smoked. Um, so there are various tools. One is this dab rig right here. Um, and these little dab pens. So these are little teeny tiny things. They look like maybe a little whistle or a stylus, um, but that is a dab pen and it gets to a certain heat to break down that waxy substance and vaporize it. Another common form of a, a cannabis concentrate is a cart or a cartridge. Um, you can buy these, the top half has the THC oil in it, you twist it onto um, a vape pen and then you are able to um, vape the THC oil that way. Again, also very highly concentrated THC, 80 to 85%. Um, also to note, these look very similar to nicotine, so it's hard to determine between the two. And once these are empty, they can be refilled um, and resold, and we have no way of confirming what is in fact inside of these. So what do we wanna know about these highly concentrated THC products? First, the method of extraction. So there's always a solvent use, butane, carbon dioxide, other chemicals, and those are being inhaled into the lungs of the consumer. So we don't know those long-term effects of inhaling those chemicals over time. They're also very highly concentrated, much higher than that flower cannabis form. Um, so it does lead to those non-fatal overdoses, psychosis, blackouts, paranoia. Um, so these are popular among our youth. Um, we just want to be aware that these products are out on the market. Other products that are marketed very cleanly, clearly to our youth are edibles. So the difference with edibles versus um, smoking or vaping cannabis is that these take a little bit longer for the body to break down and get that high that the consumer is chasing. Um, so they may take a little more and a little more and a little more until they've taken too much and lead to those um, um, episodes of blacking out or psychosis, but they are fun, colorful, good tasting and smelling, perfectly marketed to youth. Now here you'll see um, these are called THC test strips. So if you find a substance or a concealment item or a vape device and you are not sure um, what it is being used for, these are surface tests, surface swabs that you can use to determine if it is THC versus or not. Um, so you take the swab, rub it over the, whatever it is that you find, whether it be the substance or the concealment item, and you'll rub it on a card and results appear within seconds if there is THC um, detected. So these are external, these are not mouth or urine tests, it's simply a surface test. So there is a large risk of chemical dependency when cannabis is, is started at the teen level, similar to alcohol. The younger someone starts using, the higher the risk for dependence. So one in six teens become chemically dependent versus one in 10 adults who try can cannabis will become chemically dependent. And that boils down to the brain being very susceptible to cannabis use at this time. Also important to note that there are studies that show heavy use of cannabis in teens is linked to things like lower grades, less likely to graduate high school, less likely to enroll in college, um, more likely to earn a lower income or be unemployed, and overall life uh, decrease in life satisfaction. So there are all long-term um, outcomes to early cannabis use. 
So unlike alcohol, which is water soluble, cannabis is fat soluble. So that means it's taken up into the fatty tissues in our body. And that includes our brain. So our brain, inside our brain, we have neurons and a, neur a neuron's job is to communicate uh, messages from one to the other. So if we get a good grade on a test, our neurons communicate with each other and tell us that we should feel good and be happy. To protect those neurons, they're wrapped in what's called a myelin sheath or a fatty layer. Um, and so when someone smokes one time, smokes weed or uses cannabis one time, you see it, a little bit of a speckling of that THC on that fatty layer. If they don't consume cannabis again for two weeks, that speckling is leached from the body and get gotten rid of through sweat or urine, breathing. Um, however, when we continue to use cannabis, you see more and more peppering of that THC on those fatty tissues. So that's slowing down the chemical messaging sent by the neurons. So we see more poor memory, concentration, more uh, poor perception for those that are using cannabis because the brain's trying to fight through all that substance um, that's stuck to the fatty layer you can get up to about 400 layers of THC around the neuron before it stops recognizing and responding to THC. So that's when teens may move on to another substance to chase that high that they're no longer getting. You can stop and it will repair and remove from your body, but it takes about two years to eliminate that THC from the fatty tissue. It's also important to note that medications taken for ADHD, depression, or anxiety, they can't get through those layers that are um, surrounding the neurons. So if your teen is suddenly saying that they don't need their medication anymore, or their medications aren't working anymore, that could be a red flag and worthy of investigation. Any questions on cannabis before we move on to prescription medication? All right, Sandy, I'll hand off to you. Thank you. So let's talk about prescription medications. Let's look at some stat statistics here for King County. Um, if we look at here again, we're missing 2020 because of COVID, but great news still, it is on the down, downtrend, which is great. That means programs like this are, are getting through. And um, in the next slide, we will talk about these uh, medications. So three of the most common types of prescription medications people misuse are narcotics or opioids, which are the painkillers, the central nervous system depressants, which are medications used to treat anxiety, insomnia. So those are your benzodiazepines or your barbiturates. And then you have your stimulants. Those are your amphetamines and your metamphetamines, and we'll get into the first one, which are the opioids. So the opioids, I'm sure you're familiar with Vicodin, Tylenol with coating, Oxycontin, or Percocet if you've had surgery, you've been on them. So as you know that the U.S. is facing an opioid ep epidemic, so it's imperative that we keep any prescription medications in this drug class out of the reach of children and dispose of medications uh, properly. We um, Northwestern Medicine does um, team up with the DEA program and we do drug take back. And um, it's gonna be the, 12, the 20th National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. And that is gonna be on Saturday, April 22nd. And then our um, hospital will be coming out with some flyers and we'll make sure that um, you get some in your school as well. So very important. So if you or your loved ones do have prescription opioids or are concerned with your child misusing opioids, check with your local health department about becoming Narcan trained and having some available to you in the event of an overdose. I do wanna say that Michelle and myself can also do that teaching on the Narcan. The next um, medication is the central nervous system depressant. That's your Clonopin, your Nebrudol, Soma, Valium, and your Xanax. So the central nervous system depressants, they do not cause a euphoric high that, that opioids do, but they do have relaxation effects. So these are needed to um, treat anxiety, panic, acute and stress uh, reactions and, and sleep disorders. So misuse of these medications can lead to chemical, chemical dependency and death. So the CNS uh, depressants work similarly to alcohol in the brain. So what did we say that alcohol causes in the brain? Slurred speech, poor concentration, confusing headache, lightheadedness, dizziness, dry mouth, problems with movement and memory. 
lowered blood pressure and slowered breathing. And um, there is a reversal for the benzodiazepines, which is a medication. And then there is no reversal for the barbiturates. The next uh, class I wanna talk about is the stimulants. That's your Adderall, your Concerta, your Redolin. So stimulants or uppers, as they're known, have been gaining use and popularity as study agents, especially in college age students because they can result in improve, improved alertness, focus, and feelings of euphoria. Early treatment for overdose can be activated charcoal. Another treatment could be a sedative. And then we have another um, types of medication that's a growing trend and its prevalence of fake prescription medication. So these medications, if you look at the screen here, you have real and fake. They have the same letters, the same numbers as a real medication. So when someone said you can go into um, WebND and look for pill identification, it's gonna tell you it's that, but it's really a fake because people can stamp pills at home and sell them on the streets. So most of these um, prescription, or most of these fake prescription medications contain uh, uh, fentanyl. It's an opioid and consumption can lead to death. And this next screen, I believe we have the um, take back program, the one I was telling you about. So it's the Northwestern Medicine is going to be hosting it. It's on, on Saturday, April 22nd. We're still waiting for the flyers to come up, but I'll make sure that you get them. Um, on the next screen, it, um, you, should, you see a picture of some eyes. There, if you have a suspicion of someone that's using a uh, misuse of substance, you check the individual's pupils. So the dilated pupils are um, stimulants or uppers, right? That's the, the, the black that you see on the eyes. So constricted, constricted pupils are like the pinpoint. Those are depressants or downers. And like I said, if you find a, a prescription pill and you're unsure what it is, you can go into WebMD and it will show you um, what medication it, it should be or it is, whether it's fake or real, it won't tell you that, but it will tell you what it is. On this uh, next screen, it just kind of gives you some clues for you to, to look over an individual with the COVID pandemic it, you know, has changed how we interact with each other. Here are just some signs you may see over a screen that could be indication of substance use, but you can also see this in your classroom or at home. Um, the top one, of course, we have is visual vapor, or we have the sleeving that is um, when they kind of do this a lot. You see them bring their um, wrist up to their mouth um, or hiding in their clothes, they're anxious, uh, frequent breaks, they're turning off their camera, nausea, slurred speech, bloodshot eyes, and then of course the change in baseline behavior. There is unfortunately, unfortunately, due to the number of substances out on the market, we cannot cover every single one available in today's program. But we did cover the most common kinds that our teens are experimenting with. And substances like meth, heroin, inhalants, cocaine, and molly, to name a few, are typically not a starting point for a youth. So just to reinforce, early intervention is key. It prevents further exploration. And the earlier we can get them treatment, the better the outcome will be. So how do you stay up to date? you know, a drug trends are always changing. So kids are getting more creative and the amount of substances and concealment items continues to grow. So you're gonna have to do what your kids do. You know, go on there, Google it. How do I get high? How can I hide my drugs? Just be sure that when you're doing this research, it's done on a personal computer and not your work computer. Right? And then talking to um, kids about alcohol and drugs, um, I believe this is Michelle here, who is our mental health lead. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Michelle. All right. Thanks, Sandy. Mm -hmm. um, so now what do we do with all this information and how do we make it actionable? Um, well, we want to do our best we can to deter our children, our students, um, people we might coach or counsel um, to help um, avoid 
having them even start or test the waters to begin with. So we need to start these conversations um, with youth early, as early as nine years old. So that's oftentimes before they're exposed um, to peer pressure or substances. Um, you know, show how you feel about, about underage uh, consumption of substances or alcohol. Um, believe it or not, 80% uh, of young people aged 10 to 18 say that their parents are their leading influence on their decision whether or not to drink. So send that clear message um, of, of where you stand with that. Um, young people are more likely to listen when they know that you're on their side. So reinforce the why behind it. I love you and I want you to be happy and healthy. Um, and make sure that you are that informed uh, piece of information or that source um, for your child or your student. Um, we wanna be that reliable information and we wanna be giving that information. We don't want them getting it from friends or TV or the internet, as we know that that cannot always be that trustworthy source. Um, be present, show you're aware of what your child is up to. Um, so if they think they're gonna get caught, they probably won't engage in it. Um, and then, you know, even if you think that your child is not going to be experimenting with substances, peer pressure is incredibly powerful. So it's good to have a plan in place to help avoid um, drugs and alcohol to help your child make those better choices. So talk about what they would do if they face, they're faced with a decision um, to consume or um, maybe a code word or just practicing saying no in general. So we call those exit strategies. Now these can be, low key conversations that happen over the course of a time. They don't, it doesn't have to happen all at once, but multiple interactions, maybe taking advantage of a, of a commercial where you see somebody smoking and talk about it then, or you're watching a movie and there's some kids at a party. Those are really good opportunities to have some of those um, lighthearted conversation, but planting the seeds about where you stand. I had mentioned exit strategies earlier. So these are um, a few uh, peer pressure exit strategies that just being direct, just say no, um, you know, avoid the situation altogether, M maybe use some humor. Oh, you know, I kind of like my lungs, I'll pass, or I'm on the swim team and I need my lungs. So you can give a reason for saying no. Um, there's lots of uh, parents that have said in our, our programming that they tell their kids to use them as an excuse. My mom would kill me if she found out. Um, so just having some of those things in your child's back pocket uh, might be really helpful to deter them from using to begin with. But despite our best efforts to deter them, um, children are going to experiment with substances. Um, so I'm going to push us forward to this next slide. There's a little video on um, from Your Choice Prevention on what to do if you find something. So let me pull that up here, maybe. Let me know if, Sandy, let me know if you can, can you hear it. Hey everyone, it's Katie from Your Choice and I am going to talk today about what to do and how to handle it if you find something in your child's room, your child's backpack, or somewhere else. So the first thing you want to do is take a minute and not panic. And I know this is easier said than done, but panicking and rushing into the situation and just coming at it with a hot head isn't going to help anything. So one of the um, best rules that we like to give people is the 24 hour rule. And this is just give yourself 24 hours to kind of process it, think about what you found and then how you're going to handle it from there so that you're coming into the situation with a very clear and level head. The second thing that we recommend doing is taking the item. Um, now this can seem like an obvious um, answer, but a lot of times parents will say to us, oh, it's their property, they bought it, I'm gonna let them keep it, or maybe they're holding it for a friend or something. Um, our recommendation is they shouldn't have it, so take the item. And you can be creative with this. Um, maybe you take it and you don't say anything and give them a couple days to see if they'll come to you. Um, let them sweat for a couple days, let them think about um, where it might have been, that's okay. Um, I've also heard of parents being creative. So um, I heard of one mom 
who found a bong in her child's room and she pretended she thought it was a vase and so she put flowers in it and put it on the kitchen table and waited to see if her child would say anything or not. So you can be creative, um, but you can take the item. Um, we recommend taking the item and that's definitely something you should do. Third, we recommend coming into the situation when you do have that conversation with your child come into the situation with a set of consequences and make sure these consequences are very clear, very thought out. We call it an if-then situation. So your child knows that if I do this, then this will happen. And so you wanna make your consequences, you know, applicable to the situation. So, um, you know, say you find, you know, I have here a vape device. Say you find a vape device in your child's room now, it doesn't make a lot of sense to ground them from TV or ground them from technology forever. Instead, you want to set up your consequences in a way that's helping them stop the behavior and helping them quit while giving them enough incentive. So maybe, you know, a consequence would look like you initiate nicotine testing or um, you talk about changing some friends or you talk about different ways where you can help them uh, modify their behavior. So to learn more about items you might find in someone's room or to learn more about prevention education and different resources, please check out our website at www.yourchoiceprevention.org. All right. So just a good actionable piece on what do I do now should I find something? Um, so here are just some references and resources should you need or want to write those down. And in, while you're kind of peeking at these, I'll leave them up on the screen. Sandy and I are going to dive into some of the concealment items that um, kids are using these days so that you're aware that they're out there um, and they might seem innocent and harmless, but they could mean more. Um, it's important to note that some of these items are inexpensive and they are easily accessible at Spencer's Gifts or Amazon. Um, you don't need to be 21 years old to purchase these items. They are um, marketed as ways to, um, to keep your personal things safe. Um, so anybody can get their hands on them and that's why they are still on the market today. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing. And we're going to review a couple things. So um, we'll start with the easy, straightforward things here. Um, we have a lanyard here that has the marijuana leaves on it, as well as a folder that has 420 or um, 710. So these aren't necessarily concealment items so much as they are showing that somebody might be interested or into drug culture. Um, for those that don't know, 710 upside down does um, spell oil. So that's um, like hash oil or marijuana oil, THC oil. Um, that's what some of those things mean. On the top and connected to our lanyard, we have this little concealment pack. Um, it screws off and inside um, you can wrap things in a cotton swab or in a tissue and store pills so it doesn't rattle and things of that sort. Now the COVID pandemic has certainly brought um, a lot of this around hand sanitizer. It's on little keychains on our bags. It's here at our desks, it's everywhere. Um, so this can be emptied and filled with something. It also helps mask strong odors and smells. So um, you'll note that you will see heavy perfumes or colognes, body sprays, hand sanitizer, um, Carmex. So this is something that has a strong odor, can be hollowed and emptied out, and pills can be stored in here. Um, an Altoid container inside of ours, and I'll try and show without spilling, we have little nicotine pouches in there mixed with the mints that hides that smell. And then this is like a Trident type gum pack, but really if you open it up and remove the back, um, it is concealment item. And these are nicotine pouches that might look like little gum pieces. Um, so things with strong odors to help hide um, substances that may have a strong odor. Dan, do you want to pick up some of the things you have? Oh, you're muted. Okay, I've brought over the um, deodorants. 
So when you look at this deodorant and you know, it looks like the deodorant brand, you open it and actually it's a compartment for um, anything really, uh, some drugs you can hide in here, powder. And then same with the um, deodorant for female, it um, smells like a deodorant, it looks like a deodorant, but then you have to take this out. So you have to touch it. And inside is a little pouch where you could um, keep some drugs and it keeps them from rattling around. So, you know, you have to find people that actually want to go in here and take that out because, you know, people use it for real deodorant. I have a couple more here, Michelle, that I brought. It's the chapstick, another concealment item. If you take the bottom, you can put some mm, drugs in here with no problem. You can put some cotton in there to keep them from rattling. And um, it's a real chapstick. And I also brought um, the dab container. And this is a uh, silicone. So when you open this, you know, they uh, put that in here and it doesn't stick to anything and they could um, use that for the dabs storage. I also brought one of my favorite things, which is the um, hairbrush. And the hairbrush, if you take the top off, it is another um, place where you can store some items. And again, stuff it with, um, tissue paper or cotton and keep it from rattling and you can still use it, right? Who's gonna look in your hairbrush? And um, I didn't show this earlier, but this is um, something that you put on the back of your phone and this is where your jewel goes. So if you see anyone with these on there, um, you know that they're vaping. And um, help me with this one, Michelle. I like this one. <laughs> Oh, that's a one hitter <laughs> lipstick. So if you pull the bottom off, you can put your flower bud marijuana there in the hole, heat it up, and then Sandy can show the top of the lipstick. It's got a hole in it and that's where um, oh. you would inhale from. Nice. Yep. Looks just like a lipstick. All right. Any more over there, Sandy? It is. Ooh, we oh, we want this one. Whoops, this, let me go. This one right here. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> So this is a tampon that is marketed as nobody's going to mess with your personal things. But if you open it up, it's actually what's called a booze tube. Um, so um, most people think that no one's going to want to look at this, especially like a school resource officer or somebody's dad might be embarrassed. Um, but we want to make sure that you're really looking to see what you think's in the wrapper is in the wrapper. Now, for those who are not super familiar with tampons, this one is quite large. So you can see a difference here in the screen. Um, so this would be a tampon um, that you would buy at the store um, for personal hygiene. But inside here, we have a little baggie. It's filled with oregano, but very easy to conceal inside of here. So make sure that your um, boxes and your um, bags are checked through thoroughly if you suspect that there might be um, substances hidden there. Same goes along with condoms. Now this one is not open. It is a condom in here, but do be sure that if you find a condom that you make sure it is closed and not opened because people, boys and girls alike, will use these um, kind of embarrassing personal items thinking nobody will look through them. I have this really cool thing here, Michelle. So this is um, a, a insert for the tennis shoes for your shoe. If you look at here, pull this out. And this is a site right there, a little box where you could actually um, put anything that you have that you shouldn't have in here. So this is another uh, place where um, you need to be checking their shoes as well. Okay. And um, what you find a lot as well, and these are coming from teachers, is that um, the kids are also putting um, some, taking this out, of course, throwing it away and filling it up with alcohol and taking these to the prom or to any sports in school. And of course, drink and then get rid of the bag or take it home and, and reuse it. So watch out for these as well. That this, one can, oh, sorry, that mm -hmm. one can also be used for like a crushed powdered or pill substance. Oh, true. Um, 
in the hospital, we give a lot of big pills or crumbly pills and applesauce to our elderly. Mm -hmm. It just makes it easier to swallow and conceal. So that can also be mixed in with the applesauce and consumed. Right. And then, of course, you know, everybody's walking around with water with COVID. The um, the fountain the fountain drinks, what do you call them? The Water fountains. Mm-hmm. Water fountains. <laughs> They're still closed in a lot of places. So um, if you pull this apart, this is another uh, place to stash. Okay, so maybe if you always see your child or a student walking around with a water bottle all the time, and it looks to be like the same one, and they don't drink off of it, maybe kind of just go over, you know, of course, follow the um, your school rules and um, see if maybe might be one of these special ones. And same goes with um, a can of pop, right? If you open this and take this off, you can stash some things in here too. I mean, they're just very creative and it looks real. It is heavy. It looks like it would be a drink. Inside there, I think there is actually something. Oh, do we have something? I think there's something concealed. We do. What, whoa, what is this, Michelle? I think that's our THC cart. So that would be something that would twist onto um, a vape and then you can vape THC. There we go. Tiny, tiny little guy. Goes in here. Let's see what else do I have? Oh, I have a key fob. So if your student is walking around with a key with no um, identification of what kind of car it is, or they're too young, they shouldn't be driving, uh, pull it apart. And it's another area to hide. Oh, where do you open this, Michelle? Do you want me to do it? Mm. Just pull it apart. Like Just pull Tupperware. it apart again? Like a Tupperware. Oh my, like a Tupperware. While she's doing that, um, <laughs> I'm going to show you a little water bottle trick. So I have two water bottles here. Um, mm-hmm. If I shake one that's regular water, and hopefully it's shows over the video it kind of stills very quickly so bubbles and then stills now this one has alcohol in it if i shake this you can see it stays fizzy and bubbly so if you see a lot of water bottles in a classroom and uh, sitting on people's desks and you're seeing behavior that may seem like they're um, intoxicated or maybe they're in your basement with their friends give the water bottles a shake see what they do if you're seeing bubbles and fizzes um, chances are there's alcohol in that water bottle and I think it apart. Got that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I took it apart. There we go. <laughs> Another place to hide or concealment. And of course, this one has been around for a very long time. You know, we used to um, use them. We take the bottom off and we put our keys on there, right? We put our keys in here, but um, not anymore. They're used for um, as a concealment item and they're very. Um, they're not very costly at all. And you can get this on Amazon or Spencer Gifts. And then of course you would use this for a water bottle because water still fits in here and you could use it for that. It just comes with a little special compartment. I'm gonna show this one. This one is raising popularity among our youth. Um, So extracts, extracts have to have at least 35% alcohol in them. It's baked off when we use them, Um, but kids are smart and they are buying these from Target or Juul and um, vanilla in particular can be added to coffee or um, smoothie drinks. And this is um, 40% alcohol, which makes it 80 proof. So school dances, football games, basement parties, things like that. If you're finding these around, um, chances are they are um, being consumed for um, alcohol intake. I think that's about all. We just have a couple more. I think we can squeeze in a few more. So this is a battery feels like a battery, looks like a battery. I don't know if it works like a battery, probably not, but the top screws off and inside is a small concealment item. Um, This permanent marker, These are working Sharpies. The back of this one is a one hitter. So um, you put a little bit in there, heat it up, and then you can smoke that. And here's another um, one hitter pipe. So you can see this is a regular highlighter on the bottom of this one, it's gold, but kids can make these at home by taking off the bottoms. If you pull off the gold part, it is a one hitter pipe. Let me use my muscles here. Um, Flower bud marijuana in there, light it up and you have yourself um, 
a working pipe. And then last but not least, this working Sharpie, the tip comes off here. And inside, this is just rolling paper um, for flower bud marijuana, but in here you can hide anything. Um, and it is, it is a working Sharpie, so you would not suspect anything else if you found it in a pencil bag or on a desk. Um, so I think that that concludes both the drug trend program and the concealment items. Um, feel free to drop us any questions. If you have anything um, that you want to know, I'm happy to send along the list of resources again or the link to the video if anyone would like to see it. Um, but thank you so much for having us and for um, educating yourselves on this and helping improve the lives of our, our youth. There was one question, Michelle. It says down here, now that there are dispensaries out there, what is the impact on young adults? Um, so I think it's just more easily accessible. The hard part is, um, I don't know so much dispensaries, but gas stations and vape shops are usually where um, youth are getting away with buying things underage because they're not carting as hard. Mm -hmm. um, I think dispensaries, because they're so new, are following protocol as best as possible. Um, but it's easy to find an older friend that can get that for you as well. Um, I think because of the legalization of marijuana, it's also more common in houses. So um, if parents have it available and readily available and they're using it, um, it's easier access in general. For the kids. So. Yes, mm -hmm. so I hope that answers the question. Um, if not, I'm happy to clarify, but thank you all so much for having us today.